We'll go ahead and start our afternoon session. So um, I'm an internationalist by training, and my focus is going to be on stents. You all have patients who have, who have had coronary stents. Um, this uh, field goes back all the way to 1929 when Dr. Frostman did his first uh, right heart catheterization, and believe it or not, on his himself. First coronary angiogram was done by Dr. Sones up in New York, and then balloon angioplasty was done by Dr. Grunzik, who's considered the father of uh, international cardiology in 1974. Uh, and the first balloon angioplasty in the coronary artery was done by him in 1977. In the 1990s, uh, the stents came along, and remember, all th throughout all these years, the only way to treat other than medication for coronary artery disease was bypass surgery. And we'll go through what the stents meant, but again, from 2007, we have this drug eluting stents or drug coated stents, which is pretty much have become the standard of care. So let's reflect on coronary balloon angioplasty, what, what it really means, what do we actually do in, in the cath lab on those patients of yours? Um, so this is a uh, cartoon which shows atheroma. You can see us uh, running a wire, um, which is followed by a balloon and most of those atheromas are very eccentric, um, and we expand this balloon. As we expand this balloon at high atmospheric pressure, anywhere from 8 to 20 atmospheric pressure, it expands this artery. You know, we, we kind of consider ourselves plumber. The good thing is for us is we are dealing with arteries which are very expandable, almost 1.5 times the normal diameter. So we take advantage of that, and by expanding this balloon, we are able to open up the channel for the blood flow to go through. There was a problem when we started doing balloon angioplasties. As I said, this was a process we did in the 1980s, but a lot of those patients develop what is called abrupt closure. So you come down with the balloon and right away, right while in the cath lab or very soon after, afterwards, they would close down. And a large amount of patients, almost 20% required emergency bypass surgery. Not only that, even the patients who survived, almost 30 to 50% of those patients had restenosis, uh, re and that led to repeat angioplasties and repeat uh, procedures in almost one third of those patients. So very frustrating times in those days for balloon angioplasty. In the 1990s, um, actually in 93, bare metal stents got introduced. Our hospital, I don't know if many of you know, but Houston Methodist was one of the first hospitals to do a coronary stent with Dr. Lewis and Dr. Reisner. And what this idea of coronary stent was to create this uh, cylindrical mesh of, of wires which allows that artery to be kept open. So you would still go ahead and expand the atheroma with balloon angioplasty, but then follow that by putting in a stent. And when you put in the stent, it allowed for that artery to stay open. Unfortunately, that trauma, that barrel trauma, whether the pressure or whether the dissections we created, led to high degree of restenosis. So a lot of those patients would return back to the cath lab with repeat interventions, almost 20 to 30 percent, because of restenosis. And restenosis is not a function of cholesterol buildup; it is a function of scar tissue or neointimal uh, proliferation. That required the need for drug eluting stents, and drug eluting stents. Um, basically uh, prevent the cellular response, the scar tissue formation from inside uh, the, uh, the stent which has been previously deployed. So what are the current indications for stent procedures? So you, you all have patients. Obviously one classic in indication is STEMI. The second is patients who come in with non-ST elevation MI or unstable angina. So these first three categories is what we call ACS or acute coronary syndrome. Now, the fourth category is stable angina. Patients who you all see in your offices, in your practices, has some dyspnea or chest tightness when they exert, but they feel fine, they go about their life. Well, what is the current guidelines or what should be the first optimal therapy? Usually, rushing into a stent is unnecessary. Um, more than often, the best course of action is medical therapy with de deferred stenting down the road. Angina equivalent is another large category where patients talk about fatigue, they have arrhythmias of their heart, they have LV dysfunction. 
and often very atypical symptoms, especially heart disease in women is very atypical. Uh, years after years, we see their spouse, their husbands with coming to our office and not once the woman has complained, but just talks about being tired and it turns out to be premature coronary artery disease. One of the important indication is what is called high risk, high risk stress findings. So somebody who has an ischemic defect which is very large are at high risk of cardiac events and hence probably revascularization benefits those patients. So their symptom level may be uh, mild, but if they have high risk uh, stress test finding, we would recommend revascularization usually with a stent. Now, in asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic patient, objective evidence of moderate to large area viable myocardium with moderate to severe ischemia is an indication for PCI. So that's very important to remember. But what also we have been trying to do is create a heart team approach in patients who have coronary artery disease, especially of diabetes or multivessel coronary artery disease. We are trying to get our surgical team, the PCI team, as well as the cardiology team on board and discuss those patients' best options. Because there is a growing field of indications for those patients where even as providers, you guys probably say, well, why did my patient not go through bypass surgery? Why did my patient get a stand? Or why was the stand not done? And there is a lot of gray zone. Even as of today, these are hot topics. What about left main? This is the main artery of the human heart. And uh, for years, this was absolute no-go for coronary stenting and bypass surgery was a gold standard. But with the last three odd years, I think that has changed, better stent techniques, um, uh, better uh, techniques of how we uh, take care of those patients after the stent is done has allowed us to allow some patients to do left main stenting. Multivessel disease, osteal lesions, chronic total occlusions, bifurcation stenosis, calcified lesions, tortuous arteries. So those are some of the findings you may come across on the angiograms where a decision often has to be made with a heart team approach uh, with discussions uh, with our surgeons. But there are also certain patient characteristics. Uh, are they too high risk for surgery? Uh, do, do they have diabetes? Uh, do they have chronic kidney disease? Certain stents have nickel as part of their uh, design or are they at high bleeding risk? So all these things ought to be accounted for before we make a decision as to which therapy the patient ought to be offered. There are complications which uh, one ought to know including major events like MI death stroke but excess side complications uh, in US, the vast majority of the stents are still getting done through femoral approach, but you will see higher and higher amount of your patients getting radial through their wrist. Europe, it has become almost a standard of care and in the needle is also moving in US. So we are expecting to do more and more radial cases, hopefully which will reduce excess side bleeding. Um, contrast induced nephropathy, CIN, allergic reactions, perforations and stent thrombosis. So what is, what is the so big thing, such a big thing about drug eluting stent? So there are three parts of it. To make any stent, you require the stent metal or the design. You require the drug which has to go on it. But to carry the drug, you have to coat the stent with a polymer. Polymer is a little plastic layer which is put on the metal and the drug molecule attaches to that. So we have changed the metal. In the past, with bed metal stents, we were using stainless steel. Stainless steel is a very inert substance. However, you require very thick struts to allow uh, for the drugs to be delivered. So we have been going to thinner struts. The thinner struts are made out of cobalt and platinum alloys. They have high radial strength. You can see them really well. They have high radio opacity. And they're obviously as biocompatible as stainless steel is. So all the new generation stents are pretty much moved away from stainless steel. We also have changed and evolved in the choices of anti restenosis medications. If you had put in a drug eluting stand in 2003, 2005, the drug we would have used would have been what is called paclitaxel, which is an anti malignancy drug, uh, same group of drugs as taxol, such as used in breast cancer. But we have basically moved on from there to all Lymus group of, groups of drugs. One of them, which is called Avrolimus, Sirolimus, and Zotarolimus. And all the new generation stents, pretty much you guys are exposed to today, are using Olimus group of uh, family of drugs. And what we can do is we can actually have a stent literally 
designed to perfection. And over years, over the last decade, we have learned how much dose of drug to give, how long a dose of drug to deliver to that part of the vessel, and so on and so forth. And that has led to almost perfection of this uh, metallurgic and stand design trials, where we believe that three to six months of drug elution is the ideal time, and all the newer stands are giving three to six months of drug uh, elution. The polymer, which, as I said, is used to coat the stand, to, it, is used, it has certain characteristics and purposes. It is there to protect the drug. It is there to give consistent dose of the drug, the timing of the drug, the amount of uh, release. Uh, but also, it enhances the mechanical and the vascular integrity of the actual stent. So this is a, a kind of a summary slide of what sort of stents we all have available. The ones in the red are no longer used. The ones in the yellow are what you guys are going to see in your practice, your uh, patients with. And if you look very carefully, you can actually see that the strut, strut thickness, which is a second uh, uh, row, it has gradually reduced. So the, st the stand struts have become very thin, only 70 microns, and the polymer thickness has also gone down. And as you say, we have moved away from paclitaxel and are using olimus uh, drugs. Stand failure, as historically was a big issue in the bare metal stand, has become very uncommon. So from 1970s to 1990s and now 2000, our focus has changed from keeping the artery open. We are really going into the vascular healing process and reducing restenosis process. So for example, failures are almost unheard of nowadays. They're probably less than 2%. Emergency bypass surgery is probably less than 0.5%. Restenosis rates have plummeted from 40% down to less than 10%. Stent thrombosis is less than 0.5%. And very late strain thrombosis, which happens after one year, is again less than 0.5%. Basically, once you have a patient receiving current generation drug eluting stand, your rate of TLR or the need to repeat a intervention to that particular area is all said and done less than 5%. So 95% of those patients at one year are free of disease. But that being said and done, we continue to have this catch-up phenomenon. Our field of stents today as much as it has done so well, we feel that as we follow those e patients out to three years, four years, five years, we do have one to two percent event rates per year. To combat or to improve on this, we have come, come up with new, new types of stents. One of them is called a biodegradable polymer stent, which is a polymer which, is, which degrades after three months. And the reason it does that is because once the polymer is gone, there is no source of inflammation. So we have tried to create this stent what about trying to completely get rid of polymer? This is a very new, innovative design. Hopefully, it will be available to us in the next few months. But this has holes made on the vessel wall side, and it eludes a drug, a molecule of drug, which actually inhibits neointimal restenosis. There are also bare metal stands. It's almost like going back to 90s, but reconfiguring them. This is a particular stand, which is Teflon. You know, you all have. Uh, you know, we all have cookware, and basically when we, those are coated, this is coated with the polysin F surface modification, which pro, uh, prevents any thrombus formation on that stand. So this has no drug, it is bare metal stand, and some early data is very promising. So you may see this particular type of stands used too. You may have heard over the last couple of years about bioabsorbable stands. We have been very heavily involved in this research field. Uh, this is a stand which completely dissolves or absorbs at about two years. Um, the first three months, the drug eludes. After that, the mass starts dissolving, and over the next 24 months, the stand is completely gone. So that coronary artery, after the treatment has been received, is completely free of the metallic stand, which is kind of very cool idea. We really believe that this is this is the future. However, we let uh, we landed up getting a massive roadblock with stand thrombosis. The first generation bioabsorbable stand in which we worked on in the last five years, showed a high risk of stent thrombosis, which leads to MI and often death. And because of that, that program has taken a step back, but we are continuing to work on this research. So maybe in the next five years, this may have another impact uh, in our patients we take care of. This is just a quick example of how a coronary stent is done. We have a catheter which sits in the ostium of the right coronary artery. This is a can, can you play that? This is a picture of the right coronary artery. And basically, you, I'm sure you all can appreciate a severe stenosis in the bottom half. And what we do is we bring in a wire. This is one thousandth of an inch uh, wire. 
the wire crosses the lesion over that, a balloon is brought in, and as you can see, we are expanding the lesion with a balloon, um, and after which, a stand is put in, and this is what a final result will look like. This is what a coronary stand procedure is like in the cath lab. To optimize our procedure, we have varieties of tools and technologies. One of them is called IVUS. IVUS is where we can see the inside atheroma, calcification. We can see the stand, an old stand which has been put in. We are also using optimal coherence tomography, or OCT, which is, which is very high resolution, even better than IVUS. And you can actually see on the left side the metallic stands and the scar tissue which is formed inside the metallic stand. And on the right is an absorb where there is no stand to be seen, and it's a completely beautiful golden tube. We are also, some, uh, we mentioned in the morning session about FFR. This is uh, having more and more application today. FFR value, if it is less than 0.8, is considered very significant. But if it's less than, uh, an, an IFR less than 0.89 is considered very significant. This gives us physiological data in addition to anatomical or angiographic data. We have atherectomies, which are burrs to use for calcified lesions. So other devices so, so for thrombus aspiration as well as protection devices are used. There are certain other techniques uh, which we are using. So arteries which are completely blocked, we actually go into the vessel wall and re-enter beyond the completely blocked artery and then push the atheroma out and put in a stent there. We can also go from the left coronary artery or the left anterior descending artery through the septal collaterals into the right coronary artery to go a retrograde approach where we can actually poke through a totally occluded artery from the other side. These are CTO techniques. Here at Methodist, we also have started doing robotic PCI. Robotic PCI, as you can see in this, in this photograph, the operator has a console where they sit almost uh, farther away from the patient, and there's a robotic arm which drives the wires, the catheters, the stents, um, and that is done in a very safe and effective manner. Antithrombotic therapy, my subsequent speakers, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, but antiplatelet therapies, for example, I just wanna make, make sure we mention this. For patients who are non-ACS, somebody who comes from your office with an abnormal stress test, those patients, if they get a bare metal stand, which is, by the way, extremely rare, I would say less than 1%, require antiplatelets only for four weeks. But if they've got a DES or drug eluting stand, it requires it for six months. However, if the clinical setting was ACS, everyone, doesn't matter what type of stand, requires it for 12 months. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.